And as we begin to think about this, the really wonderful thing I heard is my stepsister went here more years than I want to remember, and she loved it here, loved it here. And a number of people that worked for me over the years have always extolled the virtues of Penn State. But the one thing they always ta told me that you were famous, uh, famous for was growing grass. Um, turf management, I, I, you, turf management, I think you were calling it. And so the exciting new thing that we've been introduced tonight uh, to is you have a new turf to defend, a new turf to manage, and that's innovation. You are leading the industry in the relationship with businesses. You are leading the educational environment in innovation and thinking through what must we do to adopt to this new world. And this new world is coming right at us and coming more rapidly than you could ever imagine. So, let me borrow a quote from PwC, a very respected consultative firm. Here's what they say. You can go, they blog it. This is something I think we want to think about as we start to really think what's going on here. And it's very simple. The world is in beta. Everything that you thought is the way things are, were being done in the next three to five years is going to change completely. Everything. Now, you could go back to, I, I think back to electrification, when Tom Edison and I were thinking about <laughs> what could we do? And Tom, being very smart and inventive, said, well, how about light bulbs? And it became a good business for him. But and the idea, think about electric, electrification, and think about its impact. Or think about mobility. You see, mobility in my mind was great um, because in my day what would happen is I could do a fitness workout and talk on the phone at the same time because the cell phones in those days weighed about 22 pounds. <laughs> hello? 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 I had a bicep that was a killer on my right side, <laughs> left side here. The point is, is that when we think about it, you're sitting there looking at your phones right now. There's a young lady, she's looking at checking this all out. Hi, how are you? And at the end of the day, we can't let go of them. They become our life. They manage our day-to-day -day life. They manage our fitness, thinking about the pumping iron. Uh, they do all these things. So keep thinking about what are the things in your lifetime that have changed the way you live. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to change the way we live. So if I could, I think we're going to show you just a little peppy video to get you going. We are indeed approaching a seminal moment. A tectonic shift is imminent. The basic platform for how services are delivered is shifting, not replacing labor with cheaper labor, but replacing labor with cognitive systems. This phase that we're going through goes by all kinds of different names. I prefer this idea of the second machine age. The label cognitive computing is a really good label for it too. Call it what you will, it is a real phenomenon. And over and over again, I'm amazed at how quickly events are overtaking our expectations, our frameworks, our old ways of looking at the world. That first true cognitive engine can service Claims processing can be the financial advisor of one of the largest investment houses here today. Rod characterized it as the ability to sense what's happening, whether it be emotion, data, fact, whatever it might be, to understand and learn, and then to act on it. I know it seems simple, but that is the key. To be able to answer a question as a human would understand it through learning in natural language. It's always been about optimizing solutions around technology and then figuring out how to train the humans. And I think what we're seeing with cognitive technology is you're flipping the lens on that. As you speak with Amelia, she trends where your emotions are, where they're going. And then she can use this information for decision making. We don't need to optimize the system around the technology anymore. We need to optimize the solution around the human. And that's what the cognitive technology is really allowing us to do. And that's the real power of Amelia. The one thing I can say with, with really strong confidence is 
we ain't seen nothing yet. As, as Amelia improves, as her siblings and her family tree expands, the advances that are going to come are going to make what we've seen so far look like the warm-up act. So I apologize for the very commercial nature of the latter part of that, but I think that it begins to whet your appetite for what is coming and what might I see. One of the things that we talk about here is really attacking jobs, and we're going to really think our way through. For those of you who are students, I want to help you plan your next career. It might not be the one you would envision. It's going to be very different. And how you interact with the kind of technology we're going to talk about tonight is really going to uh, shape the kinds of jobs you'll think about doing, uh, the, the kind of value and content of those jobs. It's going to all change. And so we'll excite you with some of that tonight. So let me tell you, Darren said it before. Let's just highlight this. We're only going to get a chance tonight because we only have three hours. Um, for the talk. Um, so we're only going to be able to focus on a couple of areas. But I want you to understand that if I was a student today, I would be smiling. Because in the future that I'm facing, I'm seeing the most incredible time, as Darren described it, the most incredible time of innovation since Tom and I kicked off the light bulb. Actually, I, I do think about Alexander uh, Graham Bell and I, when we started the phone, that was important, but we won't go back, that was just a kid then. The, the point is, is that every one of these technologies is going to have a monstrous impact on our society, on job creation, on investment and innovation in our country. Uh, it's gonna change everything. I'm marveling on how you take a Xerox machine and make something out of it. Um, where it actually comes out the other end, if I think it right, uh, where you take all of this and all of a sudden you actually produce something physical. I don't get how you do that. So I'm gonna have to study that one more. There's some more in here in the genome. Uh, we, we have such incredible opportunity now to understand our human bodies and to solve and serve uh, society and, and you know, fix disease and cure cancer and all the things. The amount of knowledge and data that we get to work with. But, so, but tonight, the only thing I want to talk to you about is us, knowledge workers, people that have been whoa, untouched uh, by innovation. Now, when I say that, I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. Here's what I would tell you. If you worked on a farm back in the 1800s, you would have not liked Cyrus McCormick. You see, he came as a threat to you, and it was going to change your job. And he did for all of agricultural. You know, in the 1800s, early 1800s, 75% of us worked on a farm or were doing something with, you know, building product, uh, making food, growing corn, whatever it was, so we could feed our families. 75% of the people in the United States. Today, you want to take a guess on how many people today work on a farm or in food creation? Two. Two percent of our population now works on a farm and grows enough food, not only for 330 million people in the United States, but we feed the world. What happened? And I will tell you, innovation, technology, we changed the way farming was done. Well, the same thing happened in the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, we're making products and services, and the next thing inside of that Industrial Revolution, what comes along? Robots. Robots start doing jobs that frankly were boring as all get out. I don't understand how any of you could be excited about your first job in an automobile manufacturing facility where you put the lug nuts on the tire. There were people who had those jobs. Maybe some of you in this room had them. Um, four at a time, front and the back. And you had a partner on the other side. There were two of you putting lug nuts on a tire in a, in a manufacturing facility. Stop it. That kind of job just cries out for innovation and robotics. And in fact, that's what happened. And you know what happened? 
We became competitive in our automobile industry. We produce cars at much better profit margins. The car industries are more profitable than they've ever been, and the Japanese are on their heels in terms of our ability to compete. So we know there can be positive impact from these technologies. It's happening every day. So let's talk about this knowledge work. What's happening is there are so many forces of what we're going to call digitalization. This concept of the world's changing, we'll go back to that beta, it's about digital. Everything's about digital. Everything's about your phone you're using, uh, the internet, all of these kinds of capabilities are in fact amassing and attacking how work is done and how businesses are run. And that could be social media, that could be a compute, that can be the, your cell phone, the iPad, all of those kinds of things. And everything internal to a company is being revolutionized. I, I call it the uh, digital revolution inside of a company, or more appropriately, a digital renovation. We need to think about how we're going to renovate our companies to bring them up to date. Think about some of the big box stores. This is not about renovation of the actual products on the shelves. It's about a renovation on how you serve your client. Just think about Amazon and what it's doing to the industry. Their, their accumulation of Whole Foods. You know, I just think about what I'd like to have tomorrow night. I can speak to Alexa and the next thing I know, it comes to my doorstep the next morning. We didn't have that five years ago. We didn't have that three years ago. This is amazing, the pace of change that's coming. So as we look at these kinds of things, not only are the businesses changing, but you're changing. We have to think not only how education is managed, how we really look at the cost of operating an edu uh, educational institution. We need to think about where we're going to put our human capital dollars. How are we going to spend those dollars? Wouldn't it be best to spend it on student and education and less and less on the humdrum staff type functions? Let's give those over to the kind of technology that can take them and free us up to do the kind of value work that we do. This is pretty exciting time. And digitalization is going to cause this. Look at the quote, 83%, 83% of the CEOs said there's a digital revelation uh, that we've come to that's about revolution and I've got to get on board. Now, I don't know what the other dumb 17% uh, CEOs are thinking, but sell their stock. Um, that's all I can tell you. Now, here's my picture that I, that I want you to freeze in your brain and take home tonight. Look at the left-hand side of this chart. This is the way things used to be. You had a business process, something you were trying to accomplish and do in your business, and you used people symbol, lots of people, and you use technology to assist you. The new era has flipped this. We still have these business processes we have to address, but now we're using technology in many ways to take care of those type of functions and business processes, and we're assisting them with you. Best way I could describe you was I just put a mortarboard in your head and threw a tassel on the side, but that's intelligence. You see, what's going to be required in the new world is a better educated, more intelligent, more understanding of how do I integrate with this technology to get the power from this technology, to uh, make myself more efficient, to rise up the value of my job, to become a contributor, to become more strategic, to become better at thinking, all of those kinds of things, that's going to be the power of the individual going forward, aided by technology that takes away a lot of the humdrum, routine, tactical kind of thing. So nothing could be more valuable in the future going forward than an educated individual who can contribute with this technology in better managing these business processes, innovating, changing the way they're done, helping us to become more competitive. That's our world as we face it. Don't think about digital labor as attacking your job. Think about digital labor as a partner in reconstructing your work. This is really important. And although we talk about replacing a human worker, we're not talking about complete replacement. 
We're talking about the aspects of your job that cry out to be replaced. Think about how many things you do today in your jobs that seem a lot like putting those lug nuts on that tire as it passes through the assembly line. That's what we're talking about. Could you take your work and reconstruct it and on one side put all the things that you would like not to have to do? You see, that's what we're inventing. We're inventing something that absolutely can do what humans do, but choose not to or don't want to do. We're going to build a partner for you to work with that has a lot of the knowledge and capabilities that you have. It's going to assist you. But most importantly, that technology partner every day is going to get smarter and smarter and more capable and more knowledgeable and gathering more and more data so that you become more powerful every day. I believe this is the era of individualism in terms of contribution, where you start to really take your brain, your training, and your capabilities and ignite it using this digital technology, partnering with you going forward. Now, let's give you some statistics. There's a company called Scribe that gave us this, and I just want to use it as one example. One example. Here's what's happening in the marketplace today. Teachers and individual students. What's going on? There are 580,000 computer sciences jobs open as we speak right now. We've trained 38,000 people for those opportunities. We go on, it's even more daunting. Look at the next one. We're going to need 1.6 million cybersecurity experts. We're not training them fast enough. The only place we're training cybersecurity experts right now and well is in the military. And they come out of that skill set and come in to work for businesses. Every business, your uh, Penn State, every college, everywhere is under attack. We even saw it in our election process. Although we're still waiting to see whether or not it had an impact, the fact of the matter is we were dealing with states that were attacked by an outside force to see if it could, in fact, change our election. That's pretty scary. How about Equifax? This is a tried and true company that's been around forever. And one of the trusted things they did is they did your credit report. And you never thought about it once, that there was any problem or corruption of that credit report. Now you do. Somebody attacked, found a way into that environment, and destroyed Equifax. The CEO's gone, the management team's been fired. It's a disaster right now. But the impact on you is it puts your credit scores and, and credit information at high risk. How did that happen? I would argue there were not enough investments in cybersecurity and understanding. Either they outsourced it to someone or internal. Either way, they didn't protect themselves. Every day you're going to read about a company like that. My, uh, not too long ago, there was uh, TJ Maxx, had all of its credit cards stolen. I mean, we could all think, just go back and put in your mind how many times you've read about stories where someone has broken in to very critical information and stolen it. What happens to that? So at the end of the day, we need these kinds of capabilities fast. We need an education system that's going to breed them. Let me tell you something else. One of the banes of existence inside of a company today is the lack of education of the people who work there on using the tools that have been bought by that company. The software, the capabilities. It's unbelievable how poorly we think about education when it comes to the corporate environment. We don't train our people adequately. We put new software in believing it's a panacea, it's going to do everything. But well, we forgot yeah, people use it. <laughs> how are they going to know how to use it if we don't train them? So in a corporate environment, we find that about, uh, I think it's a, a frightening number, but about 20% of the software that's purchased really gets used in a very valuable fashion. About 80% kind of goes on an average basis or not well used or replaced after a few years. Why? Ah, well, it didn't really work. Well, you know why it didn't work is because you didn't spend the time to educate the people who were supposed to be helped and assisted by this technology. 
This is a huge problem inside of our corporate environment. And it extends out, when I think about the world campus, one of the reasons why um, Dr. Weidman and I really hit it off was I love the fact that Penn State is thinking about not only the students on campus, but the people who aspire to be students and change their careers, to gain more knowledge and capabilities. Why? Because they want to work in a corporate environment and they want to be the people with the mortar boards on their head that have the intelligence and capabilities that can use some of these tools and, and things that are being bought by corporations and brought in for their supposed benefit. Actually, a lot of these tools are burdens. They don't become prolific in terms of their abilities and, and therefore, um, frankly, wasted expense and investment on a part of a lot of companies. So if we had... Um, you know, good eyesight, which is a test for you in the back. Here's what I told um, Dr. Jones. You're gonna be so excited. I stole, is that okay? Uh, I, I stole, I took, you know, I, I, I grabbed information from some of your reports. And here's what you're saying, just emphasizing what I talked about. We're changing the nature of jobs. We're changing the nature of what you should be studying and planning to go do. We're changing uh, many, many things. And the jobs that are growing, data security, data, data security, data mining, data statistics, uh, you know, you pick anything in data. If I pick a word data, it's because, you know what data is? Okay, I'm gonna go date myself again. And so far, none of you have scoffed at the fact that I hung around with Tom Edison. So I'm gonna go back even further and see if you, okay, he's not that old. Um, 1848, does anyone know what happened in 1848? Pardon me? <laughs> All right. That's, that's okay, that's right, I was around then too. Okay, gold rush, gold rush. 1848, this country was rocked by the excitement of going from New York to California, where no one would go, uh, in a covered wagon with a lot of tools and equipment that people bought with no knowledge whatsoever of what they were about to face going across the country and where a lot of people died and lost a lot of their stuff, um, and then only to get to the gold and you never got it. But that gold rush changed the country. And we went to the Manifest Destiny, California started to grow. It's amazing what happened. People were chasing wealth, wealth creation. I will tell you the number one value, the gold of this era is data. Get into the business of data mining. Get in the business of extracting information, data that's lying in, in the archives of your companies and your college and all the things that you have. Facts and information about people, about process, about all those kinds of things and put it into a useful form. That's the goal of now. That's the California gold rush is now and the ability to use this data in useful fashions, to be able to integrate it into your thought process, to educate yourself with it, to help the digital employee we're gonna talk about right now. Any of these new technologies are going to be fueled by this new gold called data. And making it useful is our challenge. You have all of these abilities you can look this all up. The fact of the matter is, all of these fields are growing, except that legal field that we're killing off lawyers, but that's another subject altogether. So let's go and just remind ourselves, why are we here as a company, and why IBM and Google and Amazon and all the fine uh, companies that have joined us this evening, why are we all here? Because we all buy into Penn State's decision that we must drive digital innovation. We must put out for the college for 2025 and earlier, we must change the way we think about education. We must change the way we think about educating a student. One of the things I love to hear about Penn State was your interest in taking students 
and turning them into interns, connecting them into businesses, allowing the students to really learn practical kinds of information, working alongside of businesses, helping them innovate, helping them to drive businesses. The whole reason for Innovation Drive is that alliance between the professors, the faculty, the students, the educational facilities. All these things now become one. Why? Because if we're going to educate our students, if we're going to make them prosperous and productive and capable in this new environment we were describing earlier, we have to change the way we bring education to life for these students. It's something that I remember finally when I was going to school. Um, when I went to school, I didn't really have any idea what I wanted to be. And so I have always been intrigued with the idea of teaching, so I invented a school. I didn't go to school after that, I just ran my school. I, for two years, the government was nice enough to send me big checks, and I ran a school for disadvantaged uh, young, young people uh, having trouble learning. In those days, we didn't know a lot about learning disabilities. We, there are a lot of things we didn't know. But what we did know is if you came alongside of an individual, and these are typical eighth and ninth graders, it's pretty much their last chance. How do we help a student really understand and ignite in them the desire to be educated, to learn, to be able to have math facts and read and do those things, so at a minimum they could be a productive member of the society? Wow, I gotta tell you, I learned so much doing that. I'm not ever going to uh, denigrate the professor's role in my life either, and the educational professors, my history major, all those things. But the most important thing I did during my years at school was running that school. I learned so much doing that. And that's why I'm excited about the concept here of really uniting the business corporate environment with the student education process because we're going to have to rethink your skill sets. What's gonna make you productive in this new economy is completely different than it was when I was going to school or when people are going to school five years ago. It's changed that dramatically. So that's what's exciting about what you're doing. And a number of the goals are all really well fueled by the technologies represented by companies in this room and by ourselves this is what makes this very exciting in terms of the partnership. So, long-winded as I am, here's what I'd like to do to finish. I want to introduce you to Amelia. This is your next employee. This is the person that you're going to align yourself with who's going to become an instrumental part of how you do your job or wherever you are, again, um, I don't care if you're in the medical field, you're a lawyer, you're, you're, um, you're an educator, you're in corporate environments, you're running a financial uh, group, you're, you're running a call center. Um, my favorite one about using Amelia is in a call center. Uh, this is what I always ask, and I'll do it tonight, and, and if I succeed, this will be great because it'll be the 50th time this has worked perfectly. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Hopefully you're all still with me. Uh, how many of you grew up wanting to be a customer service agent? Okay, 50 in a row, zero. Nobody out there wants to have that job. Okay, and there are a lot of those kinds of jobs here where you are the front of Penn State. You are taking the brunt, let's use that word, of all of the questions, the issues, the concerns, and so forth, the frustrations. All of those things come right at you. You're at the front. Maybe you're one of the great advisors here. And when we look at that kind of job, who would want that job? First of all, it's, there's never staff enough. Uh, it's always fraught with gobs of problems. You never have all of the data that you really need to solve that problem immediately. It's not available to you. You gotta hunt for it. Excuse me, could I put you on hold? No, if you do that, I come and you know, strangle you. you know, don't do that or I'll pluck your eyebrows out. No, you don't get to say those things because you don't pay any attention. Go scream and yell at an IVR when you're trying to book an airline, right? Just feel that frustration. That's what we wanna change. We want to bring a digital employee as a partner into a call center. Let's bring calmness and respect and problem solving into those kinds of environments. It could be done.
We can make a digital employee as knowledgeable or more than any other person in the call center. And you know what's gonna happen? It's gonna be fun, we've already seen it. Here's what I believe. See if you stay with me on this one. I believe that there are only 10 or 15% of the people in the typical customer service call centers that you call into with an issue or a problem, only 10 or 15% of those people are A's. The rest are something less. So I always ask a corporate uh, executive, a CEO, I always say this, excuse me, I don't understand. Eight times out of 10, maybe even nine times out of 10, I'm going to get somebody on the other end of the phone or chat or wherever who's not your best and brightest and excellent. Why would you ever do that? Why don't you think about how could I raise the capability of the entire center so everyone was an A? Not possible in the classroom, not possible until this point in a business environment, but by giving a digital employee as a partner to an agent in an environment, we raise up their ability. They become more knowledgeable. That person was just being trained, they're as smart as the best person that's been there for three years. The person that's kind of struggling a bit in the job, they're raised up immediately because they can depend on their partner, a whisper agent called Amelia. We change again our thinking about how do we conduct customer service? And here's what's happening in the business world. And you're doing it as well. We're in an incredibly intense competitive environment right now. I don't care uh, what business you're in. Even if you're in a Penn State and people are just dying to come here, the fact is you're still competing for students. What makes a person want to come here? I call it experiential branding. I want you to think from the outside in. How do you perceive Penn State? How do I perceive Walmart? How do I perceive uh, Citicorp? How do I perceive the businesses with whom I do business? I create in my mind a sense of how they treat me, and that's how I define them. Are they pleasing places to do business? Uh, do they take care of my needs? And if they don't, you know what I do? I go somewhere else. So this experiential branding, this concept of how do I create an important vision and sense of this company, that's what Amelia can help do. She can really focus on that experiential branding how do we want to be perceived? Well, we want to be perceived as helpful, uh, rapid in our ability to resolve. We want to have the information at our fingertips. All of these things are things we want to do. How do I do that? Well, well let me finish this by saying, you don't do it with something we call chatbots. Now, chatbots are incredibly uh, valuable in today's world. There's a lot of companies doing quite well with them. They're, in my mind, um, created opportunities where they can script a solution. I call them uh, kind of software uh, supervisors, where a process can be rethought and redone. That's great. That's not what Amelia is. Amelia is not a chatbot. She, for all intents and purposes, is a human. That's what we've created. Now, let me give you the last example so you get a sense of what Amelia is capable of doing. I want you to envision yourself. You're working for my company, and you would like to know how many days off I'm letting you have. So you call me up, or you send a chat, and you ask me a very simple question. How many days off do I have? Now, of course, in my company, two. Uh, but, but, okay, 26. I'm being very nice. 26. You know, I'm feeling kind of the, under the weather. Um, I'd like to take a couple of days to rest. What would you expect a human to say at that point? Wow. You would say, I'm sorry you're not feeling well. You see, I understood the idea of under the weather. I'm pretty smart. And I also wanted to demonstrate empathy. I'm sorry that you're not feeling well. Now what's the next thing a human would do? How can I help? Could I call your supervisor and let them know? Oh yes, yeah, that'd be good. <coughs> you know, that good fake cough always works. It worked at school for all the days I missed. <coughs> I 
chest be, hey mom, I don't feel great today. You know, do you ever put the thermometer on the light bulb? That always worked well. Until one my morning, my mother called the emergency ward because it was 108. I hadn't, I didn't do enough of that. It was really dangerous. But um, I digress for a second. Anyhow, the point is, is that you're getting human responses. Now watch what else happens. You're in the human resources group. You've, you've now executed on your, I have a couple of sick days, et cetera. And something else popped into your head. I'm not feeling so well, but my 401k is going great. Um, can you tell me how much money I have there? How's the stock doing? She answers. Well, you know, I didn't tell you, but my wife's pregnant. Um, what, do we, what do we get for paternity leave? Because I'm going to be a new dad, and I really am excited by that. How much paternity leave we have? Oh, that's really great. Tell me again about the 401k, because i got to think about my kids' college. Do you see what's happening here? We as humans are very expressive. We're not chatbots. We don't like being put through rabbit holes like the airlines typically do. We want to talk, we want to express ourselves, and we want to hope the person on the other end is just as expressive and caring and interested in my issues and wants to resolve my problems. That's what we want. That's called customer service. That's called caring. That's called providing your advisory services and helping your students. That's called diving into the problem with transfer credits or curriculum descriptions or scheduling or any of those kinds of things. You're going to want to be able to provide that because they asked and you want to help them. That's what a digital employee can help us do without the one thing that we're unfortunately not able to do, just add a lot more people. You see the picture that we showed before, you show, saw the density of the amount of people that were needed at the time to do those business processes. We can't do that anymore. We have to find different ways to accomplish our business tasks and our processes. This is what drives us to utilizing new technologies as partners in the process, not replacements, partners. And so as I finish, I'll give you even a better picture of her. She's smiling. You know why? Because she wants to help. She really wants to be a part of this university. She wants to come alongside of every one of you and figure out how could we do the kinds of things we need to do better, more responsively, with more caring, with more insight. You know, one of the things that she can do is she can begin to build a personal profile on you. Let's go back to that example in the human resource environment. When you called in and she found out you weren't feeling well. But you know what happened when you were in that conversation? You mentioned that um, your brother was in a uh, state swim meet. Big, big meet. And he was likely to win. The next time you call into human resources, do you know what she'd be able to say? How'd your brother do in the meet? Wouldn't you want that? Every time you interface with a company, every time a student or a prospect or a world campus adult uh, student, any and every time they came into this environment, you showed them the personal side of this institution. You asked them the question about how the brother go, or how did that class go? I knew, I knew we were dreading taking that one. I know that we set up that curriculum. I know that's a tough professor. Um, how'd it go? Wouldn't you want to be able to do that? And if you didn't have the time to be able to do that because you're so scrunched for time, you can't your own be that personal. At least I have somebody reminding me right at my side. Say something. Get personal. Respond. End of the day, that's what we're looking for. So I'll leave you with my final comment. I'm guessing most of you in this place use Amazon. Could I have a show of hands? OK. Pretty much all of us. Why? Because it's so easy to do. It's so easy to do. I can sit at my desktop and order whatever it is I want. I could shout now at Alexa and say, while I'm at doing my dishes. Yes, OK, you're stunned, just like you were about me and Tom Edison. I do my own dishes. So I'm standing there, and I ran out of Dawn. Uh, Alexa, order me some more Dawn. 
oh, by the way, I'm having a uh, spaghetti party tomorrow. Um, I need some special uh, spaghetti sauce, a couple of tomatoes, and give me the pasta I like. I can't even remember what brand, um, but it's that wagon wheel stuff. I really like that. The sauce gets in between it. It's really good. Um, guess what? Next morning, it all arrives. It all arrives. And more and more, Amazon's getting intelligence about your buying behaviors. It's learning a lot about you. That's all great. But you know what's missing? The personal part. You see, I like shopping. I like going to the grocery store. Craig was talking about going to Wegmans and seeing all these people. It's our only community place anymore. I'm going to go shopping, and I'm going to see 10, 10 people from the university. I'm so busy, I don't get to see them. But if I go to Wegmans, I see them. And the people at Wegmans are so nice, I want to go there. Why? Because I like humans. I want to be treated that way. We're, we're taking with technology, we're taking the personalization process away. And I think as humans, we're regretting that. We want it back. We want to be treated in this fashion. And what we have designed Amelia to do is to bring back personalization, humanization, and free up her partners in whatever function they are to be able to have those moments to be able to do that. So, as I said before, and I'll finish, we're so excited about the opportunity to work with you, to accomplish these kinds of capabilities, to introduce this new technology, and to work alongside of you doing what? The final word on the slide, uh, the uh, presentation, the video, imagine. You see, when you have this kind of innovative technology, we have the opportunity to imagine. Imagine what we could do working with Amelia or any of the technologies that are represented in this room. How could we change my job? How could we change the institution? How could we change people's impression of us? That's the excitement. When you get up tomorrow morning, imagine your future with this kind of technology now at your fingertips. Thank you for being such an attentive uh, group tonight. Sorry that we probably went a little longer. No, actually, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh oh. Since this was such an engaging talk, uh -huh. I'd like to open it up for anybody that might have questions in the audience. We do have, I just learned we have some mics in the room. So anybody that might want to ask questions, you got one over here. I just want you to know this is how we work, okay? First of all, I want you to know that I'm depressed. Um, my Red Sox are losing badly, and uh, therefore it was really difficult for me to be, uh, you know, kind of bright and cheery, but I'll get through it. And the second thing I say about questions um, is this. Boy, this first one better be really good, <laughs> because it sets the tone for the rest of the people wanting to ask questions. So no pressure. Feel free. Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> um, uh, uh, do you think there's a danger of extrapolating your experience or my experience, our education, background, those kind of things, on what that worker wants? When I think back, think about people I know now, they like those jobs where you do this, do this, do this, and they go home, they don't have to worry about work. Yes. Uh, we, do we have a danger of extrapolating what the workers want? That, okay, he wins the prize. That, that is a spectacular question, absolutely spectacular. So let me give you my sense of this. Do you know we built America on exactly those workers, right? Detroit was built on those workers. Uh, they made $50,000, they bought homes, they sent their kids to school, um, all good things. The problem is, is that the cost of those people doing those simple tasks buried the car companies in a competitive sense, when the Japanese and others decided, I want in, I want to be able to make cars. And so all of a sudden, that heavily labor-intensive approach to constructing a car could no longer be done. So it wasn't so much that we were looking at people and saying, hey, you know, I've got this higher idea for your job content. Um, we're not going to have you do that anymore. It's that I had an economic imperative. I had to change the way I made the car. I needed to improve quality. Uh, I needed to be able to make that car faster. I needed to change everything about that car. And so unfortunately, that meant that some of the humans doing that physical labor lost out. 
But the same thing happened at the farm, right? The guy who was pitching hay into the loft, the guy who was behind the mule doing what he was doing, those kinds of jobs got taken away. Now, here's what I believe. I believe you and all of us as humans would like to be stimulated. We would like to find a way to innovate, to use our brains, to use our capability. A lot of us have that privilege, and it's the way we get up in the morning and think. I agree with you. There's a group of people who really just want to do a job, want to earn a paycheck, get that job, go home at five, and not worry about it. In other words, they don't want to carry the burden of that job, uh, as I do every night, and I'm sure you do. They don't want to carry that. There will be jobs for those people. Those jobs will continue and will sort out the kinds of people with those skill sets and desires and the people that want to drive for more. Because there still be those, those jobs available. And we can find lots of industries where those kinds of jobs still exist today where workers could go. But they're going to find themselves challenged. So I don't want them to rest on the idea that you can five years from now go to that kind of job, that lug nuts job, and believe that that job's going to be there for the long term. So everyone is going to be challenged. It's not my value system. It's really about my competitive challenge and what I need to do to make a McDonald's more competitive, um, to make me able to drive down their prices and et cetera. I'm going to have to do some mechanization, computerization inside of that very institution. Otherwise, other guys are going to come along and figure out how to do that faster, better, smarter, with better food, and I'm going to lose out. So even the jobs that I thought would be there, like working at McDonald's as I, as I did, I'm sure you did, don't, those jobs can't be counted on. That's the challenge of our society right now. And we're going to have a bigger issue of what do we do with those folks? H how do we help them? How do we educate them? Frankly, how do we support them? Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to come on us as a society that will be a result of this. And we cannot be blind to that. That's going to be a very important ethical issue for us. So it was uh, spectacular. Thank you. Yes. That's a, the question was, can we teach innovation? Um, yes. Um, perhaps not to humans so much as machine learning, uh, deep learning. A lot of things that are happening right now are sparking innovation from what you would have thought are standard things being taught but as you accumulate these pieces, there's innovation that's emerging, right? The second thing is, is that for humans, I would come back to, if you have a baseline of understanding, here's something that's happening. It's called combinatorial innovation. Now, what is that? Big word. And I was so happy to get that one out because all you guys use these big words and I wanted to seem somewhat educated. Um, combinatorial innovation, what is that? I'll give you the example. It's called Waze. If you're driving around, have you ever used Waze? Here's how it starts. GPS, what did it tell you? Route, right? I want to get to State College, great. Here's the route that you go on. But it didn't tell you about all these trucks that go about five miles an hour on one of these roads that come here. So we're sitting there for hours, you know, doing this. You would like to know that, wouldn't you? Because you would take an alternate route if you had that information. So, what we did is we took the innovation of social media, cell phones, GPS, put them together, and made a billion dollar company out of it called Waze. So, can you teach innovation? I think you can incent it, I think you can imagine it, and then I think the participants arrive, right? Why are you giving traffic information to this entity? Why are you doing that? Ah, they give you points. You get some rewards for that. Tell them where the police guy is that's going to give you that expensive ticket. How about the pothole? Where's the, where's the accident? Uh, where's the construction? Who thought that one up? Right? But it's brilliant. It's brilliant. So my sense is the, the components of innovation are out there, and there's going to be people who think about how to combine them and make them unique. I love uh, the concept of Uber. Now, we've got lots of problems with Uber now, and there's some issues with the leadership and so forth. We'll leave that for the moment. But the idea that somebody decided to run a cab company with no cars, 
no employees, and everything else, and reimagine how do I get a ride from here to there? Brilliant. Absolutely unbelievable. So I believe innovation can occur if you put in front of people, and now more and more machines, and machine learning, deep learning, and in both cases, I believe it, it, it's going to occur. Okay? So with that, I get the hook, or you want another? I'd say we could take one more question if there's one out there. Otherwise, well, if you thought the first question was tough, wait till the person who goes last. Because the only thing you're going to remember about tonight is the last question. So let's see how this one goes. All right. So we'll start with a comment. Yes. Um, as an Orioles fan, it's hard for me to root for you. Oh, thank you. But if you make it through, beat the Yankees. <laughs> that would be my pleasure and easy to do, by the way, for Alan Gibson. So the question is, yes. you know, as we talk about AI and under the umbrella of Invent Penn State, I can see how Amelia applies to Penn State from a customer service, but let's take it all the way down to that one person company that needs the same level of customer service. Yes. Talk to me or talk to this audience about how Amelia can be a tool from a scalability from the one person entity up to the 20,000 person entity. Thank you. Thank you, and a great question. So let's think about this. If you're a big company, a big institution, et cetera, clearly you can afford to invest in IBM Watsons and uh, you can invest in Amelia's and all of those are opportunities for you. That's all great. But I'm a startup company and I want to be able to avail myself of these kinds of capabilities. That's where service companies come in who operate off of the cloud and start inventing employee capabilities. So imagine this for the moment with me. I'm gonna start a new human resources company. And in my company are no actual workers. They're all Amelia's. I've trained an Amelia to be an HR person. I've trained her to be a finance accountant person. I trained her to be a marketing person. I, all those things. I trained her to be a salesperson. So what skill sets would you like to have? Right? So instead of hiring people because you're not ready yet, you, you can't make that human capital next step, you're, you're not sure about whether the business is going to fly or not, rent before you own. Right? Take a skill set and apply it to work. And you know that gradually, more and more, Amelia will have what I call horizontal skills. She'll be trained as those kinds of employees. Uh, a fast finishing funny story to that. I'm in Canada, and I'm giving a presentation to the CIO of the association. And uh, some guy goes, you know, Jonathan, this is fascinating. I don't care whether it's a cloud-based one at a time, or I invest in this, we just can't use you. Wow, been rejected, this is hard for me. Um, what, why, why can't you use this? Uh, we're, we're a labor union shop. Really, great, she'll join the union. Uh, and he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, let's just figure out what would you pay for a digital employee? Let's figure out a rate per hour for a digital employee. And then what do the union dues for an hourly uh, employee? Let's figure those out and she'll make donations to the labor union and just make sure she gets the button and all the benefits. And the guy said, are you serious? And I said, yes, because you see, once again, we have to figure out how these digital employees can be used. I don't want an impediment. So if it's a labor union, fine, she'll join the union. Um, we gotta make sure she contributes social security wages. We could do that. Um, she's gotta contribute into Medicaid, Medicare, sure. You just deduct from whatever wages you were thinking you're gonna pay her and put those into a bucket of money and send it to the state or the feds or whomever. These are all doable, very solvable, even to the point of single unit, hire an HR employee to augment your business so you can help it grow without burdening it with lots of people until you're ready. So these are, I think you're gonna see service companies start doing this, uh, the manpower, uh, should be person power, I don't know what's wrong with those people, they haven't changed their name. Uh, but if you think about it, why are you not offering digital employees? Right, you're charging for human employees, complicated, they don't always show up to work, there's lots of, bring digital employees into it. So we're working with a company in Japan doing exactly that providing digital employees, no people. They have no people. Just trained individuals in the functions that you would like to rent them for. So this, uh, going back to the question on innovation, no shortage. A lot of really, lot of really interesting stuff happening. So again, I think that's it. My Red Sox have lost, I'm depressed. You could probably, you know, make me feel good by like clapping once and then I'm going. <laughs> okay.